Well, welcome everyone out there in Zoom and uh, here in the room to our third lecture in our series on the person. Um, as you remember, I'm Jan Zimmerman, uh, professor of theology here at Regent College, and the lecture series is hosted by the Houston Center for Humanity and the Common Good. And we're very grateful also for the uh, sponsorship by the Issachar Fund for this lecture series. Uh, if you remember in the first lecture, we had Brian Greger, who took us through conceptions of self in the ancient world to hint that the notion of a person is indeed a modern construct arising from revolutionary impulses out of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, and then in the second lecture last week, Holger Zabawowski from Germany, a Catholic philosopher, showed us how the particular Christian notion of mercy and merciful acts uh, is a unique feature of the person, a feature, he argued, that enables a phenomenological description of the person that goes beyond and can be shared by, that goes beyond the Christian religion, can be shared and bought into by uh, various different backgrounds. And then after two philosophers, we were very privileged today to have a sociological uh, perspective on person and on the person. It's our privilege today to have John Evans uh, speak to us, who is the TADA Chancellor's Chair in Social Sciences, Professor of Sociology and Associate Dean of the Social Sciences and Co-Director of the Institute for Practical Ethics at the University of California, San Diego. His most recent books are The Human Gene Editing Debate with Oxford University Press in 2020, and Morals, Not Knowledge, Recasting the Contemporary U.S. Conflict Between Religion and Science from the University of California Press. And then also another really relevant one, What is a Human? What the Answers Mean for Human Rights, again from uh, OUP in 2016. So as you can see, uh, Professor Evans has just covers all these areas that are eminently important uh, for our lecture series and of general interest also here for a region audience. So um, I'm really, really glad, John, that you can make the time. And Professor Evans will uh, talk to us today on personhood and the public view, the public's views. So the floor is yours. Well, <clears throat> thank you uh, very much. It's great to be with you today. I would do something I don't usually do, which is to start with a joke, which was you mentioned that you had an earlier speaker on the ancient world. One of my favorite examples that sociologists will resonate with is I was a good friend of mine is the expert on what Isaac Newton's religious beliefs actually were. And we were at Edinburgh listening to a talk on Darwin and he leans over to me and says, oh, another talk on current events. Um, so uh, uh, I, my vision of history, history begins before I was born. So uh, this is me very presentist. Um, and the structure for my talk today is probably not that wise. I'm gonna to try to summarize two thirds of a book long argument. And in case you're interested, um, this is the book uh, that I summarized my uh, thoughts here. Um, so what it means to be human is one of the central longest running questions in Western thought. And following the theological terminology, I'm gonna call these human self identities anthropologies. Of course, this is not the discipline of anthropology. That discipline got its name because it was originally interested in that exact question, what is a human? I'm not concerned with scholarly claims about what humans truly are, only claims about what the general public thinks humans are. And there are multiple claims that believing in particular anthropologies leads people to treat each other in a particular manner, independent of what the truth of the human actually is. The most common claim by critics is that holding what the critic considers to be a false anthropology leads to inhumane treatment. The paradigmatic claim for this is that certain definitions of a human make it easier for governments to dehumanize people before genocides has been shown often. A second thing I wanna be clear about, I make a distinction between contested and uncontested humans. An uncontested human is an entity that all the dominant anthropologies consider to be a human. This includes me, you, the beggar on the street, and the prisoner in the jail. A contested human is an entity 
that dominant anthropologies disagree about. This includes embryos, fetuses, chimpanzees, people in comatose states, and human-like machines. So I'm actually gonna put aside the fact that some anthropologies define embryos as not human, and that people believing in this anthropology would destroy embryos. This is pretty predictable. Rather, I'm interested in the more radical and consequential claim that how someone defines an uncontested human impacts how they would treat that human. So the question is, if we examine the views of a thousand citizens, are those people who believe in certain anthropologies more likely in an ever so small way to treat people worse? So let me put a face on this claim. Richard Dawkins is a famous British biologist, atheist, and defender of Darwin. He's also the vice president of the British Humanist Association, or was. Um, he was accused by a journalist of exactly what academic critics say, which is because he believes in this biological anthropology, this biological definition of the human, he must then believe that we should treat people accordingly. And Dawkins claimed that his biological anthropology has no effect on his social views. As he said, no self-respecting person would want to live in a society that operates according to Darwinian laws. I'm a passionate Darwinist. Uh, however, I'm a passionate anti-Darwinist when involves the kind of society in which we want to live. A Darwinian state would be a fascist state. So another way to describe this project um, is I'm testing whether this humanistic Dawkins is actually representative of the US public who believe in the biological anthropology. Would Americans who agree with Dawkins about a definition of the human want to join the British Humanist Association along with him and defend human rights? So. Here is the structure of my talk. Uh, the entire talk is set up as a comparison between academic claims about anthropologies and the anthropologies the general public uses without being aware of the academic debate. So I start with a brief outline of the academic debate about whether holding particular anthropology leads to less support for human rights. I test these claims for the US public using a survey and I show the extent to which the public agrees with these. And I show evidence from the in-depth interviews about the anthropologies the public uses on their own without me defining them for them. So when you see red on the screen, that's where I am in case someone uh, wants to head out for lunch and comes back. So um, I am essentially testing the claims of various humanist thinkers about the influence of the public believing in the quote unquote wrong anthropology. Most notably that there's a connection or a competition among scholars and activists to get people to accept one of three general definitions of the human, the theological, the philosophical, and the biological. And I'll start with the theological definition. In the US, this means a Christian definition of the human as it is Christians of various sorts who've always dominated the public sphere. This is one of the few crowds where I feel like I do not need to explain what this is. And I think you have seen this uh, before. Um, so what many theologically inclined humanists are concerned about is the decline of a Christian anthropology that humans are those who are imago Dei, made in the image of God. The anthropology starts with the book of Genesis, um, but I think you know, you're familiar with this, but needless to say, uh, this is very similar to Judaism given that uh, Christianity emerged from Judaism. Also important, not only are humans made in the image of God, they're special because they're the only beings to be made this way. Only humans speak to God directly and only humans are given stewardship over all other living things. I'll parenthetically note that I recognize that theologians have been trying to expand the notion of Imago Dei to animals, but I'll just say to sort of preface where I'm going, that's not held by the public. Um, continuing, uh, this idea includes the idea that God made every human one at a time, and therefore each human is loved by God. Humans also have souls that allow for communication with God and with other humans. So this, it is claimed by proponents that someone who believes in this anthropology would look at another human and see something different than they would see if they held one of the other anthropologies. They would see someone who has a separable, true, unchanging soul residing in their body, and that soul not only means you're made in the image, but that you are at least capable of communication with God. So Post writes, the purported moral significance of having an immaterial, immortal soul is that it ensures the moral commitment of a good society to protect all human beings, 
based not on their varied and unreliable capacities, but on the basis of basic human equality. I wanted to draw your attention to the word capacities there, so you can see the competition uh, that that's referring to in a minute. I'm only gonna gesture to the largest group of people who make this claim, which are the Christian human rights theorists who claim that human rights cannot be justified without a sacred human of some sort. And the best avenue towards sacredness is to think that humans are being made in the image. Uh, you can, I'll just let everyone read uh, Grace uh, Cow here for a second. So that's the theological. Let me turn to the philosophical. Contemporary philosophical anthropology is technically concerned with the person, as in personhood, and not the human, asking which biological beings should be considered persons. For example, the obviously genetically human embryo may or may not be a person, and thus deserving of the same treatment as walking around consensual humans. Moreover, persons might include non-human animals, and some genetic humans may not be persons. Uh, the debate assumes this notion of a human, namely that we're not special compared to other animals solely by being genetically human. It also assumes that not all biological humans are equal since some can be defined as non-humans. The extensive philosophical discourse on personhood has an implicit theory of the human underneath it. Consensus on what traits or capacities Confer personhood remains elusive. Here's a list from Thule, but other philosophers have their own lists. Uh, and you know, the basic threshold for most people is something like consciousness. Thule has a very extensive list. Peter Singer uh, has a more trimmed down list. But the point here is not what is on the list. The point is that there is a list, okay? That there is some combination of capacities uh, that give you humanhood or personhood. Critics of this anthropology claim that it will influence the treatment of uncontested humans. They claim that people who hold this anthropology will see the personhood of humans as a matter of degree with those who have more of the idealized characteristics having more value. The basic reasoning uh, of the eugenics movement that there are certain people with certain capacities have more value uh, than people with lesser capacities. Critics are also concerned that we will treat humans more like we treat animals because we will subconsciously equate the two. This is because the anthropology uh, teaches uh, that there is no fundamental difference between animals and humans, and in fact, they overlap in their abilities. So for example, it's been said by some philosophers that chimpanzees have more traits of persons than newborn babies do. Okay, so let me finally turn to the biological. The primary concern of many social scientists and humanists is the biological anthropology. Theologians are equally fearful of the rise of the philosophical, uh, but the social scientists aren't that worried about. The basic argument is that whereas we once thought of ourselves as made in the image or as human because of our uniquely human abilities, we now think of our humanness as reducible to our unique pattern of DNA. The central feature of the biological anthropology is its reductionism, the belief that Darwinism explains everything important about being human. In this view, humans either are their genes or in a milder version, anything important to know about humans is in their genes. So for example, the characteristics important to the philosophical anthropology could ultimately be reduced to DNA or to biochemical processes. So criticizing this view, Pellegrino writes that the biological anthropology uh, that in the biological anthropology, mind, soul, emotion, spirit are epiphenomena of matter explicable in terms of physics and chemistry. And classically, this is articulated by James Watson um, and who saw uh, uh, this as part and parcel of a materialist redu reductionist redefinition of the human. He said that the reason the discovery of the double helix of DNA was so important is it puts an end to an old, a debate as old as the human species does life have some magical, mystical essence, or is it the product of normal physical and chemical processes? 
the intellectual journey that continued with Darwin's insistence that humans are merely modified monkeys had finally focused on the very essence of life and there was nothing special about it. Life is simply a matter of chemistry. So critics also claim that every published and polarized, uh, popularized study that explains genetic effects on behavior is teaching people this biological anthropology. So for example, invoking his preference for what he sees as a re less reductionist anthropology, sociologist Howard Kay writes, that as these putative genes for such things as schizophrenia, alcoholism, homosexuality, et cetera, are discovered and publicized, the cumulative effect will be a transformation of how we understand ourselves from moral beings whose character and conduct is largely shaped by culture, social environment and choice to biological beings whose fate according to project head James Watson is in our genes. This biological anthropology makes humans appear to be more machine-like or object-like, the criticism goes. Genes are often portrayed as determinative, as having a mechanical influence on behavior, and humans thus have less free will. Perhaps the most famous version of this is Richard Dawkins' idea of the selfish gene, which extends reductionism beyond the human body itself to genes that control the formation of the body. In this argument, genes essentially use bodies for their own replication, as two critics say, humans are portrayed as survival machines, robot vehicles that are blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. So finally, treatment in this biological anthropology, the critics are concerned here is pretty simple, that learning the biological anthropology will teach us that humans are more like animals and objects, and thus people will treat each other more like we treat animals and objects. If we are DNA, that is the same DNA that animals and plants have, then we are more like animals and plants and can be treated accordingly. If we're more machine-like, we can be treated like we treat machines. The biological anthropology describes humans as a species with species interests where individuals don't really matter. So for example, if a weak individual dies, it's good for the collective. Therefore, individuals are not unique with unlimited value as they would in other anthropologies. Um, so finally, if, we, if people think of humans as reducible to chemicals, you know, then we would treat people like chemicals. So abstract questions I'm raising here. And now to get really close to the ground. So I wanted to test these claims that the humanistic scholars uh, have been making. Um, and so this is a larger project, which includes a number of data sources in-depth interviews with 50 ordinary Americans, in-depth interviews with 20 PhD students in biology, 20 students in the humanities, the National Opinion Survey. Today, I will save you and only talk about these ones in the green in the, to save some time. Uh, if anyone wants to know about um, why I did this, I can talk about it later. Um, so I can assess whether the anthropologies lead to mis maltreatment using this nationally representative survey, I will tell you ahead of time, this isn't some sort of perfect test. You know, you cannot give sort of the one be all final test of a concept like this using social science. Rather, this is one piece of a puzzle that others would have to add to. Um, so to measure agreement, with of regular people with this biological anthropology, the survey began with asking the respondent to evaluate a very long statement by a hypothetical professor. And here's what it says. I'll let you quickly read that. And then it continues. This takes a lot of air time in a survey, lots of money for anyone who's interested in doing surveys. So this is an extreme, this is like an extreme statement. As I'll get to later, this is not what some high school biology teacher is gonna say. This is like what the critics are worried about, which is someone more like uh, Richard Dawkins's view of the human that they're worried about here. At the end of this statement, respondents were asked, 
You may agree or disagree with parts of the professor's statement. Do you agree or disagree with the statement overall? Okay. I ask similar questions set up in a similar way to evaluate the philosophical and theological anthropologies, but to save time, I'm not gonna show you how that works, but it's the same idea, okay? Um, the idea is to show them sort of this ideal type uh, depiction of an anthropology and then say, to what extent do you agree with this? So if you look carefully at what all the academics say about how a person's anthropology will impact the view, how we should treat each other, they say a person's anthropology creates a picture of a human or a general depiction of a human, and it's that view that makes us treat people poorly. So um, I ask survey questions that evaluate these primary claims, which is that these anthropologies lead us to see humans as not different from animals, like machines, not unique and of differential value. And these are, again, survey questions that people would agree or disagree with. As you see, I'm trying to measure each one of these actual mechanisms that critics think is what leads people to be treated differently because they believe in different anthropologies, okay? Um, and again, just to give you the background, the logic of this form of explanation in social science is, is the same person who believes in this particular anthropology the same person who believes that uh, humans are unique compared to animals? So it's a sort of a co-occurrence question. Okay, so I also asked a series of questions about human rights. Now, before I get further, I will note, as you look at these questions, this is a particular take on morality. This is summarized generally by human rights, but it's the belief in the sort of individual sacrality of a human. A good utilitarian would probably uh, give the opposite results of all of these sorts of things, right? Um, should you, uh, 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 some of the expensive medical bills uh, commit suicide to save their family money, you know, potentially. So it, it's, this is a particular form of moral view that I'm, I'm modeling here. Okay, so um, here's where I uh, flash my hands and say statistics were involved. I will spare you the gruesome uh, details. Uh, but again, the question is, um, is the same person who holds one view the same person who holds another view? Okay, are those related in that way? Um, so these are basically numbers that are like correlation coefficients, which most people are familiar with. This first row where it says bio, biological means that the more someone agrees with that biological anthropology, the less they agree that humans are special compared to animals, the less they agree that humans have equal value, the less they agree that humans are unique, and they're more likely to think that the human mind is like a machine, okay? If you look at the last row, which is the philosophical, which is humans are defined by their capacities or traits, the effects are essentially the same. If you look at the middle row, we will see that those who agree with this theological, this Imago Dei idea, are more likely to think humans are special compared to animals and humans are unique. But I should add, uh, some of these, these two, which are equal value and machine-like, equal value in particular, is a, supposed to be a, a centerpiece of the Christian tradition. And the fact that it's empirically not shows the work uh, that people in that tradition have to do to convince the people uh, in the pews of that. So similar thing, here's the relationship between these anthropologies and attitudes towards human rights. So you see, the more a respondent agrees with the biological anthropology, the more likely are to agree it's acceptable to buy kidneys from poor people, commit suicide to save money, take blood from prisoners against the will, and less likely to risk the military stopping a genocide. Same is more or less the case the philosophical, and those who agree more with the theological are less likely to approve of suicide to save money and taking blood from prisoners, but relationship between the theological and these human rights is weaker and less consistent than the other anthropologies, which I'll talk about later. So the debate about having the wrong definition of the human leading to maltreatment, somehow the, the, this is consistent with the idea that certain people have learned this anthropology 
And they're the same people who have these negative views of human treatment from this one moral tradition. Um, the same, uh, you know, people who are arguing with Darwin himself in the 1860s were claiming that if we accept this definition of a human, we would treat each other like animals. In recent years, Jürgen Habermas has been claiming that if we genetically engineer any child, we will come to think of all children as more machine-like, as instruments of our will. Papal encyclicals claim that if we think of humans as co compilations of traits, we will inevitably think that humans have differential value and inevitably treat those with fewer traits worse. Um, as historically has occurred with eugenics movements. So in uh, chapter two of that book, I catalog these claims made from intellectuals from a wide range of traditions, from political conservatives to neo-Marxists, from conservative to liberal uh, Protestants, feminists, humanists, theologians, bio biologists, sociologists, bioethicists, philosophy, and so on. Um, but this seems to be evidence in support of this claim. However, I wanna say they're only correct about the idea that believing in these anthropologies leads to this. They should continue to guard against them if this is their belief that they're worried about, but we have to keep the following chart in mind. These are standard histograms, okay? Um, my intro to sociology class, which I blessedly have not had to teach in 15 uh, years, but would, uh, uh, Conceptualize these, imagine everyone in your sample is standing on each other's shoulders. Uh, the tall stacks are where the most people are. And uh, notice that of this biological, very few people agree with that, okay? The philosophical anthropology is even more extreme. Only about 15% agree at all. And about 3% take that most agreeing category of the possible responses, okay? So the reason, um, for this is that academics who debate whether anthropologies lead to violations of human rights are primarily concerned about these extreme views. They're not concerned about a high school biology teacher teaching everyone about a human. They're worried about Richard Dawkins convincing everyone that we are biological machines run by our genes whose primary purpose is to replicate our genes. This is what the people in the debate are worried about. So that's what I measured in the survey. So while the critics are right to be concerned, if these anthropologies were widely taught to the public, I would argue they're not, okay? So we need to keep that in mind. So we should ask also, what are the anthropologies that the public is using? Um, what are the uh, anthropologies, all these people who pick disagree on these, okay? And the neutral position, um, what are they using, okay? And what is their plausible connection to human rights views? So, in my in-depth interviews with members of the public, I start by trying not to present any definition of the human, uh, but rather I want people's own definitions to emerge. So it's a dirty little secret of social science that you find the conclusions that you measure, right? Um, and so I'm in this part of the research, I was not interested in people's reaction to my defined ideas. I want them to inductively come up with their own uh, views. Uh, it's also, you know, I use this in my methods class for the grad students. I can tell you that my very first preliminary interview with someone, I started the first question with, so what do you think a human is? And drew the absolute most blank uh, stare possible. Regular citizens have no ability to talk about this at all, okay? Um, they just lack the language and they have not been rewarded in their lives for learning such language. Um, so, instead I start with a series of questions and that allow them, uh, allows me to infer their theory of the human from underneath these questions, which is a standard sociological thing to do. And here's just a list of these questions that I asked, okay? And I don't really care about their answer to the question itself. The question that I use for my data is why? So almost everyone said, we should kill a chimpanzee to save a human. And then I asked why? And you get the answers to all these things and you can categorize people into a general theory of the human. I mean, needless to say, all social science that you ever hear about uh, should be uh, evaluated in reference to the way the questions were asked. Because obviously if you ask different questions, you get different answers and that's just the way this is. Okay. 
So um, what I would like to focus upon today are those respondents who after looking at all this, say they're using an anthropology that's broadly similar to this biological anthropology. Okay, then I'll talk about the theological. Um, so needless to say, the public is different than the academics views of such matters. A basic distinction in implied ethics is between principle or rule-based reasoning and, and casuistry, okay? A principle-based definition of the human would look for a separate outside principle that apply to all entities, such as all entities with rationality above X are defined as human. So philosophy for the last century has been concerned with principle or rule-based reasoning in the United States, in the analytic tradition, I could add qualifiers here, um, such as you know, utilitarianism. Uh, and to a large extent, this is what people think ethics is. Casuistry is case-based reasoning, uses procedures of reasoning based on paradigms and analogies to decide your moral obligations. So to generalize with casuistry, you can look to an ideal type case that has been decided in a particular way and if the case at hand is exactly the same, then you decide the new case in the same way. So for example, there's a consensus that what was done to Terry Schiavo, who's this infamous case of a comatose person, uh, then if a new case is exactly like that of Schiavo, then the same ethical conclusion can be reached. So casuistry has been called anti-theoretical and based on our intuitions. One of the attractions is you don't need any theory to use it. You just need paradigmatic cases making it a perfect, it's been called the ethics for the people. American law is based on it, for example, okay? Um, so in the academic debate, biologists appeal to an external principle to define the human, which is that a human is an entity with a particular DNA sequence. The American public makes the ca casuistry argument by looking first for the paradigmatic case of the humans compared to and they all find it in themselves. They know, what they, they know they're human, so there's no need to resort to DNA or anything like that. To evaluate whether something is human, you look, you compare to yourself, which is the most consensual case of the human that you know. So what do you know about yourself? You do not look at your body and say, in your hand and say, oh, look, each one of these cells has DNA in it. Rather, uh, you look at yourself and say, your body looks a particular way and you were born from two human parents. And yes, that sounds tautological, um, but this sort of reasoning is tautological once you find your paradigmatic case. And this is how ordinary citizens use the biological anthropology. Let me just briefly go through one of my interviews with someone, let's call her Jerry. You know, I asked, should we kill the chimp to save the human? Jerry's okay with killing a chimp if it's for a really good cause, does not think the computer would be me because, quote, it does not have my processes of thought. So at this point, I haven't yet figured out uh, what she thinks a human is. I asked about the enhanced baby. Okay, you start seeing a hint of an anthropology here. She did not ponder if it was made in the image of God, like the theological anthropology would say, or if it had particular human traits, like the philosophical anthropology would say or whether it's DNA would still be human, like a PhD student in biology might say. What she wanted to know is, was it like her and her own experience? How was this embryo created? Did they just take an embryo that was growing and change it? If so, I think it would still be human because of the way it was created. That's why I asked, because I was wondering if it was like a Petri dish creation. So if it started as an embryo that was growing, then it was an offspring of two humans like she was, if it had the same DNA, but did not start as a growing embryo like she did, then it would not be human, okay? As for whether an embryo could be changed so much that it would no longer be human, she says, no, unless you change the construction of humans. Like if you were to change the way we looked or maybe change the way we would act because I feel like humans have a similar way of processing and thinking or maybe just physical appearance. So you're not going to find any academic who, who makes the tautological argument that a human is that which looks like a human. But for the public, biology enters into their definition through the biology of their own bodies. Like looks like a human is determined by looking at yourself and comparing two arms, two eyes, et cetera. 
Okay. She also looks to the way people would act to see if they're human. She becomes a bit of a principalist here at this question. Um, it would not be human for the technical biological criteria about breeding, which is uh, not very many people remember this from ninth grade, but some did. Um, this is more what a person in biology would say. This is, of course, a reminder that, again, when you look at social science, remember that no normal member of the public has perfectly coherent categorizations of things that fit academic categories, again, because they're not rewarded for doing so. Um, uh, and so you got to look for general central tendencies in the way people talk. So when I ask about the comatose person, says, yes, they're human because they're still people. I would say that they're still human, but they're not living a typical life. So she and I had earlier discussed this case of Terry Schiavo and then asked, why was Terry Schiavo still a human in her state? She said she had had a normal life ahead of time and that she was human. And then that part of the rest of her life had stopped. So she had a normal life. She lived and had family and whatnot. And then since she couldn't continue, she's still human. So someone using the academic version of the biological anthropology would probably say, you know, she still has human DNA, okay? But the general public's version says the comatose person is human uh, because they're analogous to their uncontestedly human cells before they became comatose. So finally, the clone, uh, she says, yes, uh, the fact that it's not even taking place inside a body, she's, it doesn't matter if a clone becomes, has all the capacities, et cetera. It's that this person was not, not born uh, like her. And then when I say, what is your summary? A human is, can I just say what a human looks? I don't even know how to describe it. Someone who walks on two legs, has two legs. Well, then people always say, well, people with one leg, they're still human. I don't know how to explain how they look. Okay, so let me turn to the difference between theological anthropology found in the academic debate, which I found to have a positive yet inconsistent effect on attitudes towards human rights, and the public version of the theological anthropology. Um, so before I show you patterns in the in-depth interviews, uh, and then you can speculate on what's going on here. So first off, I should say ordinary mainline Catholic respondents do not use this anthropology on their own. They don't spontaneously raise it. If you present it to them, they will agree with it, but it's not central to their minds. This is consistent with what we know about the extent to which different religious traditions in America teach theological doctrine uh, to their uh, members. Um, it's only the conservative Protestants who really know this anthropology. So what is the imago day of the conservative Protestants in the general public? Many conservative Protestants do focus on the Imago component uh, that's like the academic one. So Roger gave this categorical yes to kill the chimp. And the reason is, I think human life is a different level than chimpanzees. The uh, reason is that God created human beings, God created animals as well, but God created human beings in his image and likeness. As a result, that is a sort of straight out traditional version of Genesis here. Um, another said in their summary, a human is a man or woman created in the likeness of God that has spirit, body, and mind. And I'm human, you're asking a human. Okay. So um, now, many conservative Protestants emphasize image. When they talk about image, they talk about a lot more about being made by God than theologians do. We talk about the image of God. Okay. This seems to be to have some interesting theological implications for which I lack data, but it will not stop me from speculating for you and hopefully other greater minds than I can think about this. But it seems to me if you focus on the idea that humans are those made by, then only humans that are produced quote unquote naturally are going to be considered human. Secondly, this leads to a type of theological thinness in that if you do not have an account of the human at all, humans are those who we currently think of as humans then. And third, but made by, could be more protective of human rights. If the power of Imago Dei in treatment is that God cares about you, which is how human rights theorists talk about this, God cares 
more if God made you than if you've simply been created in the image. Or at least I would imagine that's how people's thought process works. So let me just give an example of this. Jim here focused on being made by God. Like nearly all others, he said a computer would not be me. Um, and he says, no, because it's man-made and not something that God had his hand in. James said that even if I had a robot that had feelings and full communication, I would never consider it human. I'll consider it something made by man. Man is fallible, sinful nature, and we're broken people. So anything we put our hands to, it'll never be God's creation. So for me personally, I'll never consider it to be human. Consistent with the stated criteria about being made by God, when I asked about the modified embryo that resulted in a super strong, super intelligent baby, James debated the amount of human intervention involved, which was the key issue, obviously. He originally thought the enhanced baby would be human, but then said, well, whether it be by cloning or altering it by means of man-made devices or a chemical um, that get injected into the process of creation, creating a human being that is not as God designed, you know, the DNA of one man and one woman as God designed it, and now I've altered that. I think it's damaging to society and very disturbing. These responses allow us to clearly see the difference between image of and made by components. The enhanced baby, the hybrid, the entity lacking the part of the brain, um, even, those, even though made by humans, but he did not debate this. Rather, he looked to see whether humans had anything to do with the creation. And if not, then they were made by God and thus human. Finally, let me talk about the soul. There are lots of theories of soul in the Christian tradition, and I'll just list these here for you to uh, Google at some point in the future. I'm going to talk about what's called substance dualism, is that there is your body, and then there's this material substance, your soul, that resides in your body, but is separate from your body. It's where your true self is. When you die, it travels to heaven. God creates your soul individually for you, when you're born and when you are conceived. This, I don't know the status, of, I think this is on the outs in academic theology, this idea, but it is by far the dominant version of soul in popular culture. I remember as a child watching Bugs Bunny cartoons and Daffy Duck shoots Bugs in the head and Bugs Bunny dies and this entity floats above Bugs Bunny and then goes you know, up to heaven. I think that this is just the way that Americans, including religious Americans, think of um, the soul. So, um, I think the more contemporary theological version among the academics is the soul is a more relational idea. So, Ted Peters says theologically, soul is a much more relational concept. I think that's all I need to read there for now. Uh, and Warren Brown says the concept of soul is fundamentally meant to point to the capacity for an experience of deep and rich form of personal relatedness. This matters for human rights and human treatment. What is it that gives a human unlimited worth in this Christian tradition? It's the sacred human, sacred because of this relationship to God. I think a weak relationship is to emphasize imago, just because you're in the image of something doesn't necessarily give you the sacredness. I think that the made by emphasis would make people consider humans to be more sacred because God has enough of a relationship with each human that God made them one by one. The platonic substance dualism soul is kind of like the made by version of God created you, inserted the soul, which then lives in you and hopefully leaves your body and goes to heaven. But I think that humans would be considered the most sacred if everyone thought that they had souls that were in communication uh, with God and other uh, humans, God would then care about each individual so much that at least potential for ongoing communication versus, you know, in principle, creating you and your soul and then leaving, you know, the scene. So, okay. Um, it turns out that mainliners and Catholics, and these are the major divides I can use just simply due to the religious demography of the United States. Uh, turns out that mainliners and Catholics have the secular version of the soul, okay? They will say, he's a good soul. And the conservative Protestants don't have the relational version. They have a notion of the soul, but have the substance dualism version. 
This makes it consistent with their overall theological anthropology, which is that God does this one thing and then steps back. Let me give you a quick example. Barney here, one of my respondents, also said that a person who's missing their upper brain is no longer human because their soul is gone. As for the soul, it is the marker of being made by God and your true essence, not the basis for communication. It says everyone has a soul. God has created a soul in every person. Soul is part of you that longs for something more. It's part of you that controls your action and causes you to do stupid things for love and makes you cry when somebody else dies that has a soul or when you lose something that's close to you. And I feel like a soul is given by God. That's the part of the God breathes into you uh, is your soul. So conservative Protestants emphasize the body as the container for this internal soul. Sarah here discusses this entity saying, well, it's still the body, a container. It might not have arms or legs, but there's characteristics that most humans have arms, legs. Um, mostly a human is what God gives us to contain, like a container on the earth, a home for the soul. So whether it's a baby totally helpless or an old lady totally hopeless, helpless or somewhere in between, uh, it's still human. So Steve also has this view of the soul as a true self temporarily in your body. His view embodies another angle, which is either from the evangelical tradition or taken from popular culture, can't tell, uh, which is that the soul is, is what allows humans to select between you know, right and wrong. Okay. So in response, here's another example. In the response about the question about killing the chimp, Steve says, I would put a human life more important than the animal life because humans are a spiritual being and animals are not. He continued showing how a soul fits into this anthropology. Humans, well, I believe that they have a level of complexity given by God that's more than animals have. Obviously, they have different levels of intelligence, but humans have more of a spiritual element that allows them to be eternal. Where they live out their eternity is up to them, but they also have a moral sense of not only knowing what they should and shouldn't do, but also to be able to decide if they do that or not. This is a very secular uh, notion of the soul as well. So let me speculate here about, will these public anthropologies have effects on what I'm calling human rights? I don't have a direct data on this, but let me speculate. With the public biology one, I would say it's a mixed bag. On the one hand, if a human is that which is like me, uh, then it's hard to look at you and say, I'm gonna treat you as less than human. On the other hand, what if someone doesn't look like me? This is probably a description of the origin of racism. With the theological anthropology one, again, it's a sort of a mixed bag. On the one hand, I think that if everyone had a relational theory of souls, this would be more protective. On the other hand, I think at least the made by God version and God giving you this immortal soul one at a time establishes a relation with God, which humans would then have a sort of a more sacred quality. So I think the main conclusion is that you've concluded that that's a lot of material for one short talk, but let me try to summarize. Um, number one, uh, the biological and philosophical anthropologies as defined by the academic debate and measured in these survey questions are associated in the American public with thinking of the human as more object-like. The theological anthropology is inconsistently associated with thinking humans are not more object-like. The biological and philosophical anthropologies as defined by the academics are associated in the American public with thinking it's acceptable to buy kidneys, commit suicide to save money, and not stop genocide. The biological is also associated with these. Um, the theological anthropology is associated with not supporting suicide to save money, taking blood from prisoners against their will. But few members of the American public agree with these strong versions of these anthropologies. Okay, so while the critics of these should remain vigilant, their nightmare scenario of people learning these is not actually currently happening. The anthropologies that the public comes up with on their own without me showing them things um, may be more protective of this human rights tradition. Um, but unfortunately I lack data for that and encourage others to look and with that, I will stop a bit early and uh, leave it to Jens to uh, tell us where to go from here. Thank you.